speaker has finished their presentation, please do post your questions in the comment section or chat. Okay, I'm pleased now to uh, introduce our first presenter, Crystal uh, Darger. Crystal has received a mining engineering degree from the University of Utah. She's presently working as a project engineer for Rio Tinto Kennecott Utah Copper. Uh, she's also the current president of Women in Mining for the Utah chapter. Prior to work, uh, prior work experience has included work with uh, Barrett Gold and Arch Cole. And her first experience in the mining industry was a haul truck operator at Rio Tinto Copper. Um, I'll now let Crystal take over. Thank you. Her presentation is titled Mining and the Future Workforce. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. Maybe. You all see that? So Women in Mining presents Mining, the Future Workforce and the Role of Women in Mining. So I have a question to start out with. How has mining changed? How has your opinion of mining changed over your life? Um, and if yes, how? Has mining changed over your life? And if yes, how? So for me, mining has completely changed my life. As a single mom trying to get, trying to make ends meet, when I got into mining as a haul truck operator in 2006, I nearly tripled my income. Before mining, I was going further and further into debt every month. And it was a struggle to even buy my kids a hamburger off the dollar menu. So women, re mining really empowers women but it also supports the success of families. So because of mining, I also have a passion to inspire others, especially women, to look for non-traditional industries with jobs that are high, a higher paying scale. And I'm also very passionate about driving inclusion and diversity in the workforce and getting more women to get involved in mining. Interestingly, when I first got into mining, I tried to encourage other women to get into it as well, just because it changed my life so much. And a lot of them were afraid that they couldn't manage the hours, afraid of the big trucks. And uh, it was about two weeks ago, my sister told me that she wishes that she would have um, listened and, and tried to get into mining as well. So mining has completely changed my life. You can see that um, I've graduated with a mining engineering degree. When I got into mining, I actually had to get my GED just to get into, to become a haul truck operator. Uh, higher education wasn't really encouraged in my family, but you can see now that I am definitely changing that as my grandkids um, are very interested in an education. And you can, I don't know if you can see this picture of my daughter, Carol Ann. She's actually the first person in our family to graduate with a master's degree. And she did that um, in 2020. So congratulations to her. So mining the future workforce, you can see that millennials make up 40% of the workforce with Gen Zers coming in as our interns right now, and our baby boomers are um, graduate, or graduating, are retiring right now. So millennials, they don't just work for a paycheck, they want a purpose. They're more, they're more globally aware and they're more connected than any generation before them. They're also more tolerant of differences that include gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. And they wanna make a positive impact on the world. We want to make a difference while integrating their professional and their personal lives and spending more time um, with their family. And this is especially true for women who are the primary caretakers, that uh, these flexible hours mean a lot to them. We're also, millennials are also looking for a successful high paying career or profession, which definitely is uh, mining is a great place for that. So millennials interact with technology like no other generation has before them. They're talented and they're changing the workplace and they're also shaping the future. They're a lot more tech savvy and uh, they wanna work in a place that blends, um, harmoniously blends and productively blends both men and women together, which is what women have been striving for for decades. And I found it interesting that uh, millennials are the first generation that have used the word fun to describe their dream job. Uh, us Gen Xers and baby boomers tend to be a little more uptight and consider millennials a little bit reckless. 
So Gen Zers, they, they form an opinion of their company, of the company they work for based on the company's ethics um, and their social, their practices and their social impact. They're also like millennials, they're drawn towards technical industries and work that supports the greater good. They're very interested in a four-year college education. It's more important than ever with a lot of companies requiring even more than a high school diploma to, to enter in. And in the United States, uh, people aren't necessarily that interested in mining anymore. They're, they tend to be more concerned about the impact that mining has. And overall, there is actually a decline in enrollment in careers that um, are associated with mining. You can see this chart shows the College of Mines and Earth Sciences, their current enrollment, their percentages with, um, to male and female as well. The University of Utah Mining Engineering undergraduate program currently has 39 students, seven of those are female, and there were no new female students that enrolled in the fall of 2020. So the, this is a, a chart of the Utah GDP. If you look at that, you can see mining falls way down towards the bottom of that. Um, and way up, up here, there's finance, real estate, um, professional business, manufacturing. So there's a lot of other industries that um, are ahead of us on the GDP, which leads us to believe that mining will be competing for a lot of top quality employees. And these include communications, public relations, any engineer, coders, IT, laboratory scientists, big data, computer scientists, HR. So you can see mining has opportunities that are endless and uh, your degree just gets you in the door there. So if you look at this chart here, you can see that um, women make up 44% of the labor force. However, over here in mining, women are only 13% of the labor force there. So you can see that there's a lot of opportunity to bring women into the industry. So mining, um, this, this chart shows the top 10 risks facing the mining and metal industry. And this is for um, 2020. If you look down here on the bottom, number one is our license to operate. And number two, risk is the um, future workforce. So it's a really high risk in 2020. So mining, um, as we said with the GDP slide, mining is competing for a lot with a lot of other industries for top quality employees and labor with similar skill sets. So what do we do? How do we attract and retain the next generation into the mining industry? So some of the keys that um, that I feel are important is that we work towards changing the perception of mining. And I know that we are doing a lot of work in sustainability and in environmental. Um, I know there was a pre presentation earlier on environmental, um, but really, really stressing the good points of mining and the reclamation and all that we do to make um, the world a better place. You know, we definitely need mining. A lot of people aren't really aware of of how important that is. You know, when I was going to school at the University of Utah, there was actually a movement to uh, a group of students that were trying to get the, the University of Utah to stop accepting money, accepting funds from the mining industry and the oil and gas industries. And I just thought, you know, they, they probably are clueless as to all the benefits that they get and even riding tracks and their cell phone and the things that are actually associated with mining. So, you know, really spreading the word that, of what the benefits are, but also the sustainability and the environmental presence, reducing the carbon um, footprint, the advances in technology, and um, the re remote support and connectivity. These are all things that are very important to the younger generation. They also tie into our license to operate, and they make more mining a lot more appealing to, to this generation. So this chart is similar. It's the top 10 risks facing the mining and metal industry for 2021. Again, you see that the license to operate is um, number one risk, but you, the number or the um, workforce has actually moved from number two all the way to number seven. And this is a large part because of the pandemic and how much that it has changed um, the way we work. 
and it's really changing the culture of a corporation and helping us to realize that we are actually really um, able to work a lot more from home than, than what we realized we were able to do before. And this, this really ties into to, um, some of the mines where you, know, you might fly in for several weeks at a time. But um, I thought, thought that was very interesting that it bumped that risk so, um, so far. So what is the role of women in mining? Women in mining is a nationwide, the Women in Mining USA is a nationwide organization. It's composed of individuals that are employed in, associated with, or interested in the mining industry. It's an, it's an organization that is not just for women. And the 2020 theme for mining, um, for the Women in Mining USA is changing the face of mining by influencing, pub we do this by influencing public perception to attract a more diverse workforce and how a more diverse workforce can change our public perception. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is a great time to be a part of Women in Mining. There's actually 40, over 40 Women in Mining organizations globally. There's a new um, Women in Mining the Women in Mining, um, International Women in Mining, excuse me, Associates Network that's being developed right now that is to promote a strong, unified women in mining voice and also to provide support among all of the women in mining organizations worldwide. And uh, Women in Mining UK actually has, it's something to be on the lookout for. They have a 100 Global Inspirational Women in Mining and if you watch for that, that'll be out on November 19th. That also has 10 women from the USA that are being um, honored and spotlighted in that. So that's kind of exciting to watch for and to see who those women are. And then also the Women in Mining USA is growing, both the professional and the student chapters. I know Arizona, I think is on their second year as a chapter and the Utah um, chapter has just been established this year. So definitely growing, <coughs> excuse me. So Women in Mining's vision is to pioneer the pro progression of workplace diversity and the involvement of women in mining, the women in, in their mining careers. The Women in Mining Utah chapter is to empower men and women in the industry by educating, mentoring and developing women to thrive in their careers and to change the perception of the workplace. So those all, you know, all those tie in together. Um, so how are we doing this? Women in Mining Utah chapter is, you know, we're still new, but we're still working to get things set up, but we're, we wanna promote the mining sector as a career choice for women in their professions. And we wanna do this at an earlier age to go into the universities and even into the elementary schools. I, you know, I'm a firm believer that um, if you teach the kids while they're young, then uh, teach them that mining is actually a good thing, then they'll be the next um, strong supporters for the mining industry. So, you know, along with working with colleges and universities, going down into the junior high and elementary schools, I feel like is very important. And we also wanna provide members with the opportunity to come together to exchange ideas and, and exchange information, network and create con connections. It's kind of a challenge this time of, you know, under this uh, current environment, I guess. And then also participate in educational programs. And the Women in Mining uh, uh, USA chapter or the Women in Mining National Organization actually started out as an educational foundation and they've grown a lot more since then, but we, also, we, but we do wanna support that. Um, basic idea. And then also, I know there's a lot of um, other, you know, the, the Utah Mining Association also does educational programs. And so I think that if we can all kind of unify and unite and, and work together, there's a lot of resources, a lot of information that's already been created, but I think we can get a lot more people that are willing to go out and um, do that training. I spoke, I've um, spoken with a lot of women that are very passionate about that as well. And then also we wanna do uh, more career development by hosting women in mining events where we bring in speakers 
uh, that, that speak about new technology and techniques and also inspirational stories and, and even personal development. Another thing that is very exciting is that the Women in Mining National Annual Meeting is going to be held in Salt Lake City, Utah in May of 2021, providing uh, we're able to have groups that large. So hopefully things will change and uh, the new normal goes back to the old normal. So some of the targets that we have for 2020 and 2021 are hosting um, a monthly virtual lunch and learn. And that's been very successful so far. We actually had people interested in doing presentations up until February. Our next uh, virtual lunch and learn is going to be held on November 20th. So if you're interested in that, definitely reach out so we can get you the invitation. We have a, a newsletter and a member spotlight that we're working on. And then also uh, working on doing hosting quarterly events post-pandemic, of course, and F.L. Smith has been gracious enough to volunteer to offer to uh, host our first in-person event. So we're really looking forward to that. As I said, we're also wanting to partner with schools and universities. We've already reached out to the University of Utah, their Women in Mining student chapter there to see how we can support them and kind of become uh, mentors or ambassadors for them. And then we also have been talking about doing some virtual field trips that uh, we're very excited about. Rebecca Swelly, who was our vice president, had some great ideas on that. And, uh, and Nicole Brazier is our um, committee person on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing that we are very interested in doing is um, putting together scholarships as well as an awards program. Uh, I'm very passionate about creating a scholarship for a non-traditional student, someone more like myself who went to school later on in life and kind of did things a little bit backwards, had a family first and then went back to school, raising a family, um, driving an hour back and forth to school, having a full-time job. Those are a lot of challenges and, you know, and still keeping a good GPA is, it's not always easy. And a lot of the scholarships are based on, you know, solely on your GPA. Um, so I want to provide a scholarship that is based on just how darn hard you're, you're working and you're still in the game. Um, I also, we are also working on our social network presence and doing community outreach. We um, want to work with feeding the homeless. I've also been working with an organization called People Helping People. It's an organization that um, supports, supports helping women find, find higher paying jobs so that they can get out of the poverty level. And they do this without um, funding them financially, but, but helping them to um, build their confidence and, and learn the skills. For me, it was realizing that the industry that I was working in was never going to be high enough pain and that I actually had to get out of that industry and find an industry that um, that provided the incomes that could, could get me out of the poverty level. So those are some things that we are targeting this, this year. So our Women in Mining chapter leadership, I'm the president, also a national rep. Rebecca Swally, she's the vice president. Is somebody asking a question? Sorry, I can tell if they're talking to me or. Um, Jenna Chamberlain is our secretary. Alita Brown is our treasurer. And then Emily Rose, and these are our committee leaders here. Emily Rose has been working really hard. She's on our public relations. She's got our website up and running. And Brianna Sanders has jumped on board with her to help with public relations. They've got us a, a really great social media presence and they're the ones that are working on the, the monthly newsletter and the spotlight. Nicole, as I said, is working with the student chapter and also working to, um, to build a strong education, um, you know, help, help us to get out and do more things educationally. Sarah Schwartz is working on our scholarship and awards. She's also a national rep. Uh, 
and Gina Serantoni. Hey, Crystal, we are running low on time, so if you can wrap it up. Um, okay, I will. Um, Rio Tinto is also a very good support, FL Smith, Stantec, Bar, and Wood Engineering. And if you're interested in membership, you can reach us on our website. You can also join a committee or host an event. You can reach us at Utah Chapter of Women in Mining uh, or at Women in Mining .usa. So, if, if anyone has any questions, I'll just um, jump off so someone else can get started. Thank you for your time. Crystal. Okay. Next up, we have. Peter Harala. Peter is presently a project manager for cementation in Salt Lake City. He has a uh, professional engineer and he is educated in, as a mining engineer from Michigan Tech. He is a member of SME and I believe he's also on the programming committee for this coming year's uh, conference. And he has prior experience in engineering and supervisory responsibilities with Barrick, Oceana Gold, and also Newmont. Today, his presentation is titled, Does What Learning, Learning from the Owners, uh, Contract Estimate Optimization. All right, everybody hear me? All good? Okay, thanks. So yeah, I'm Pete Harla. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, so I'm project manager at Cementation. In case you guys don't know Cementation, we're based here in Sandy, Utah. Uh, we're an underground mining and contracting engineering company. Uh, so we provide mine development production services for clients throughout the world. And we're focused on safety, committed to our ultimate goal of zero harm within our operations. So agenda for today, uh, just take us through a safety share, thinking like an owner, our desert model setup, our short-term planning project example, some bid analysis benefits that we saw, closing and then we'll do some questions if we have time. So uh, my safety topic, transition to mechanized mining offshaft is critical to continuing safe work. So this is something that we face quite regularly in our business. You know, we specialize in shaft sinking. So uh, as we get down to the stations, the levels, and we're doing all this work with jack legs. So higher exposure work being in usually challenging conditions environmentally, and then itself very physical all the while while you're in close proximity to each other and close quarters to the face. So there's a huge benefit to getting mechanized as early as possible, but this transition must be carefully planned out. And you need to create a training program to carry the, you know, the operation of the equipment safely. So the key point is take the time to transition with a thoughtful plan and you can execute it as safely as possible. So thinking like an owner, um, I've been on the owner side most of my career working for Barrick and Newmont. And a similarity that comes to mind when thinking like an owner uh, are business planning cycles. So plan, do, review, improve over and over and over again. Um, and to a degree that cycle certainly applies to our activities as contractors on projects and in the bid development process. So aligning on the objectives. So business plans adapt to changes in guidance when we receive new information from corporate. Um, similarly, on a project, we routinely facilitate requests for clients and always strive for improvements. Uh, planning for success. So on the owner's side, uh, having a clearly laid out and agreed upon assumptions list goes a long way into having your business plan being well received. And on the contractor side, it's quite similar. So having Transparency and sign off on assumptions gives the schedules and costs you produce a lot more backing and it can lend itself to working more collaboratively uh, instead of just focusing on pinpoint issues. Analysis and trade off. So, a huge part of the business planning cycle is these never ending scheduling runs. You're scheduling, scheduling, scheduling. From my experience, the owner side, uh, you know, the, the management wants to see the options, they want to see all the options. And so, uh, you want a high level understanding of the key metrics, the SWATs, the risks, the opportunities. So management then knows what levers, right, the word you hear all the time, they have to pull to control the business to manage change. And that's really where Deswick comes into play. So whether you're on the owner side or the contractor side, having a tool that allows you to quickly run scenarios, prepare data for presentations and comparisons, and visually communicate the results is really a key to success. 
And so driving decisions really brings, data driving decisions brings all that stuff together, being aligned on an objective, understanding the important metrics, performing the trade-offs and the analysis, and effectively communicating those results gives management a better platform to make quality decisions on. And so our basic model is set up, uh, a lot of stuff went into it, but the goal is to integrate essentially real world limitations to accurately depict these 12 foot round segments with very mining types and phases of the cycles and to include other relevant project activities so we could create and review a really detailed granular level of scheduling. So one of the things we looked at, material movement limitations, we controlled that industrial scheduler by using the quantity constraints and quantity limits. So we used a volumetric limitation to manage the material movements. We went down to the daily level, but we more or less looked at a week rolling average. So we wanted to give it some capability to fluctuate within day to day, because you, know, you have surge capacity underground, so you don't need to just flat cut it off. Uh, so that's kind of the way we looked at the material handling. Shift times and working times. So awesome thing about Deswick, I mean, you can set up as many scheduling calendars as you want. Just as an example here, we had some, we had a specific calendar set up for end of shift blasting. So it actually controlled when that end of shift blasting activity occurred. Also set up how much time during the shift you actually had at the face and, and shaft mucking was a, an interesting thing we needed to control as well. Um, but what was neat with Deswick, again, having the ability to control when activities happen because of the calendars, we could flip on that blasting to be mid-shift or any time and end-of-shift. So we were really able to see what's the impact of having end-of-shift blasting only. So just kind of a neat perspective having that built in. Um, crew sizes, they were also set up as a resource, you know, just a traditional resource in Deswick scheduler. And we specified the number of miners that were available and when and adjust them as necessary in the project. And equipment, um, essentially the same thing. It was set up as a resource in Deswick and we controlled them by the commissioning date when they'd be available. And then we could therefore adjust the number of units as they became available. Development, this is where we went a little crazy. Um, traditionally, things are 40, 50 foot segments, but we went down and we broke all the tasks into 12 foot segments. So every center line we had, we had it chopped up in 12 foot seg segments. Um, so it was a lot of data to work with, but this was achieved in Desmond CAD just using the regular activity types and specifying for certain profiles, certain types to cut them up into 12 foot lengths. Now, the cycle component integration, there's a lot going on here. And this is where um, we, so we achieve this by calculating all the fully mechanized cycles that we would have, you know, by the different sizes of the headings, you know, between all the different drill blast muck support, and then the resources that are required. We also looked at the transition mining. So as we're going from handheld to fully mechanized, what's the combos we have to work with there? And we calculated all those up and then brought them into Deswick. So um, some similarities with the traditional bid cycle, we always have our cycle sheets that we use. And this was now taking that work that we essentially already do, and let's put it into Deswick. So what does that look like? Well, so here, cycle components that we created in Excel. Now we brought them into Deswick scheduler activity template. So each activity template specifies a duration, specifies what calendar to use, and specifies what resources to use. So th there's just a huge list of stuff that we created, that big matrix of things that we could then pull off of to create the cycle. So these are just the different components that you're seeing. So now the mining cycles we actually create in the scheduler by combining those activity templates into activity cycles, aptly named, right? So each of these little chunks of the cycle components, we then built up into a specified, this is the cycle, this is, this is what it's made out of. So now we've, we were able to bring together all those different bits and pieces into making a cycle. Now, how do we apply that? So, okay, now we have all these 12 foot, single 12 foot solids, task solids in our schedule. And what we wanna do then is apply those cycles we made to basically transform that single 12 foot entity into the full cycle breakout. So this is where we really have a ton of details. So now we have a fully resourced loaded 
schedule because we specified how many people and what equipment it takes to do that one 12 foot cycle. And to manage that large number of tasks. So in this example that we had, I think it was 2,500 um, 12 foot rounds that we had to deal with. So Deswick has a function called batch apply cycles, really great function. Um, what it does is it uses filters that then it'll automatically apply these activity cycles to the task. And this is where the use of custom attributes, if you are a Deswick user, you know all about this, but this is where it's really handy to make a certain attribute that you can flag that these are these types, these are these types, and then your filter can batch those up, put them in a group, and batch by cycles applies it over the top for you. Um, really handy, really powerful. I will have a note though, since I did a whole lot of this stuff, careful use of batch apply cycles. You have to undo what you did to redo it. So clear your existing cycles and then reapply the new ones because sometimes you just get some funky stuff if you don't do that. So it's kind of unfortunate and you get to play cleanup for a while. Um, other activities we added to the schedule is derived tasks, the traditional method. Um, special intersections that we had, we flagged and we could put the attribute in that custom attribute to a batch apply some of these things. And uh, cable bolts, for instance, was something that we were able to flag and apply. Um, construction and drilling activities, we also created um, in the schedule just so you could do some work with limiting the construction crews and the exploration crews, seeing which sequences work best. And um, also allowed us to see as mining progressed where these activities happen at the right time because with the visual nature of Deswick, you could do some dynamic linking to say, okay, I can't start this drilling until the drifts are here or this muck base established. So uh, we wanted to have those in there in the schedule to make sure they're being done on time, but then the visual nature of Deswick is great in that you can view that it's happening at the right time. <laughs> so this slide's fun. Um, how to view the data. So animations are tremendously helpful. You know, as you're adding in new things or trying new cycles, you want to animate it to see if anything's popping up on a sequence. So you know, here it says that little guy, I wouldn't worry about that little guy, but you do, you have to worry about that. If it's not supposed to be there, you got to take care of it. You got to link it back up and you have to get it in its proper, appropriate place. Um, in Deswick Scheduler, this is something that I haven't used a ton, but I'm starting to get more into. In the report window in Deswick Scheduler, you can set up some pretty quick and easy graphical views. So if you have a limit that you're trying to obey and you have a field that you want to display, okay, so here you can see that you know, how are these values trending on a limit line that um, helps you monitor where your schedule is at and how you're controlling things. Um, I think one of the other most common things that Deswick users do is export data from the report window to Excel for further manipulation. So uh, again, back to data drives decisions, make it easy on yourself and set up templates so you can pull data out of Deswick easily, dump it in Excel, and you have this the view set up that you want. So, because you're going to be running a lot of scenarios, take the time to set that up. Um, so this example, uh, a couple of screenshots here, we have a schedule presented here. These are daily values showing material move to workforce and the rolling seven day average in material move. And we have a little bit of room here for some improvement. So in the schedule A there, um, real quick change in Deswick, change the quantity limit, re-level the schedule, export it, and then boom, we can see here, you know, that we've improved this line that we're operating at. So um, really simple and easy in Deswick. And that's back to where setting up these templates so you can view the data that's important to you and perform spot checks, whether it's a little change or a global change, having something there built ready to um, verify those changes. So all of that nerdy out, I would call it, kind of brings us to you know, what we used on the project. That was all the background work that we set up. Um, the goal of this project was to set up the mechanized fleet as soon as possible off shaft, kind of like we talked about in the safety share. Um, so some of the questions we asked ourselves here was like, uh, is there a, a best way to do it? We have multiple headings we could start to connect this loop. Was there really a best path? Um, to add some more fun to the equation, there was multiple designs to be reviewed. There was considerations for adjacent project activities. We were also doing improvement plans, so they wanted to see a range of benefits. And there are also a number of factors that just needed to be clearly understood to gain alignment with the client on a path going forward. So a lot of questions. 
So here is just a, a snippet of some of the options. We had two big design changes. Uh, the group up top here, 0.9 to 2, and 3 to 4, 3 to 4.1. Within each group, there were different mining focuses that we want to look at, and then um, our transition mining types that we talked about. This is where it was really helpful because as we got you know further away from the shaft, there was more equipment being added in. So with Deswick, we were really easily able to go highlight this group of we're here now. These should be this type. These should be this type of cycle, and we were able to improve um, our uh, our scheduling accuracy. So all those schedules we reviewed. Um, that I don't have the great pictures here for confidentiality, but what we were doing is reviewing a number of uh, scenarios with the client, giving them some key interaction shots. So you know, these are milestones that are important to them, and then. Um, here is just a high level scenario of what we did for the metrics review. So this is something that accompanied each one. And uh, so bid analysis benefits, I'll just hit some of the highlights that we saw here. So having this really incredibly detailed schedule was super powerful for, for us. The data drives the decisions, like I said. Um, the, we were able to take a really good look at the workforce utilization we were able to perform exhaustive analysis on the what ifs, and we were able to use that resource loading to really hone in our schedule. This is just a quick show of, this is one of the matrices that we set up to look at all the different options for what's the right blend of people and equipment. And so this, this whole run right there, that took me about four hours to run all those scenarios. So um, back to reviewing stuff in Deswick. So having the right stuff set up so I could quickly, what about this? What about that? All these exhaustive things I was telling you about, having Deswick allowed us to run those things quickly and easily. So in the closing here, sedimentation are best for project philosophy, being proactive. The sedimentation team used its Deswick model to frame up the options to collaborate with our client on a path forward. And our Deswick model provided an agile solution to quickly, quickly, clearly, and visually articulate the project options. And data drives decisions, like I said. So set up something that works for you guys to get rapid access to quality data. And this augments the traditional estimating process. It doesn't have to replace it, but it did help. And we thought using Deswick provided a possible competitive advantage during the processes of estimation and execution, being able to work with clients and their native data. And they gave us a very detailed level and it was very transparent. And uh, the visual nature that we were able to share with the clients was super powerful. So that's what I got. I think you're on mute there, Garland. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Here we go. All right, next up, we have Alex Edstrom. Alex is presently working as a water resources engineer with Stantec here in Salt Lake City. He has a uh, professional engineering license. He has a uh, BS and MS in water resources management from the University of Idaho. Prior to his uh, current work, he, uh, and is also his uh, master's thesis work, he was a visiting scientist uh, on a National Science Foundation's uh, sponsorship for K through 12 schools in Moscow. Now, as his name, it is Moscow, Idaho and not Moscow, Russia. They both might be a bit on the remote side, but, uh, but anyway. They, they uh, are. <laughs> uh, his presentation will be titled, um, Utah Trends in Water and Energy. All right, take it over, Alex. Well, thanks for the great introduction there, Garland. And um, yeah, my uh, my presentation uh, will be a, a little lighter on the details in terms of specifics for any one mining application, but wanted to use this. Um, I'm, I'm not native to Utah, so I, I come from uh, Northern Idaho and uh, through my career, spent some time in Arizona and have landed in Utah in the last four years. So um, I wanted to take this opportunity to present you know, some, some research in looking at big picture trends in the state. So uh, to get started, um, there's, a, there's a nice uh, tool that's come online in the past 
well, I don't know, several months out of University of Tennessee that lets you take Landsat imagery over an area and look at shifts in time for that aerial imagery. And it creates really powerful um, visuals for mines, especially, but also in this case for, for large water bodies like the Great Salt Lake. Um, and with my presentation today on trends in water and energy, um, this hits, you know, this hits things on the nose. You can see that the water level of the lake in recent years is down quite a bit. And, um, you know, in the, in the 80s, there was a historically high water level that occurred. So um, both of these things obviously impact uh, the operations for, uh, you know, those industries that are working off the Salt Lake. So that'll be, um, you know, the general discussion today. So in terms of the agenda, just a quick introduction to um, you know, I think a lot of folks that are tuning in will be familiar with, um, you know, the struggles with mining, what makes it interesting, what makes it challenging from an environmental and resource perspective. We'll touch on that. Um, and then I'll spend most of the time looking at individual Utah trends. And then we'll touch on the water energy nexus. My, again, my background being a water resource engineer, that's um, where I've spent most of my time working in the industry. And, uh, you know, picking up on what Peter said earlier, just touching on data-driven solutions, the importance there. Um, so yeah, getting into it. Uh, just to echo what everybody else has said and what folks in this industry know, uh, mining industry is essential to modern living. We, we rely on it for the day-to-day -day materials that, you know, allow us to connect, allow us to be in multiple places, but, um, you know, the, the image here, there's there's trade-offs that are happening, you know, now, especially as, as we see this ever-increasing demand for production um, that's coupled with reduced grades on, on one side, tipping the scale kind of in one direction. Um, and the industry's really done, I think, in, you know, in my, in my opinion, over the last several years, they've really adopted this need to you know, first of all, minimize costs, that's every operation, but reducing impact and improving that social license, like Crystal mentioned earlier, um, I really see, especially the, the large corporates, they're really putting all the right messaging in place and it falls to the local operations, the consultants like me to, to help execute that image and to bring people along. Um, and the reason for that is the second point, you know, mining, obviously can have long lasting impacts and to the decisions we make today extend long into the future. Um, so as we're de developing mind designs as we're looking at alternatives, it's, it's important to keep those trends in mind, which is why I wanted to talk about trends in water and energy today. Um, so we talked about this third point. So, uh, you know, we must minimize cost, reduce impact. And, um, you know, to do that, like we heard at the start of the presentations this morning, you know, mining really is a science driven industry, which is why people that um, tend to have a scientific background stay for a long time. It's, it's challenging, but it's very rewarding in working with the natural environment um, from, you know, assessing resources to, you know, reclamation through the whole life cycle. Um, so in terms of, Utah trends, uh, <laughs> nobody will be surprised to see this chart, but um, projections from University of Utah, especially along the Wasatch Front show that we're gonna go from 3.2 million people to 5.8 uh, in 45 years. Um, so obviously with that growing demand and population, um, there's a lot of different stressors, but um, fundamentally increased water and energy demands are going to come with it. And that's going to lead to competing interests among stakeholders. So um, again, that social license, bringing the right people to the table, connecting with the community, especially in Utah, that's going to become more and more paramount as the years go by. Um, in terms of Utah's trends in energy, so Utah has been a net energy producer since 1980. Um, which is great. Uh, you know, I think one of the key messages from the presentations today is the not in my backyard attitude is something that we as a culture need to get over. We need to own the responsibilities of the materials we're producing, produce them responsibly, and 
allow the community to wrestle and engage with those complications. So the fact that we produce the energy we use over time shows that, you know, Utah uh, has that culture of, um, of doing the work and not just offloading it somewhere else. Um, and I'll just say, if you haven't already read it, this Utah Energy Landscape publication uh, that the Geological Survey put out, this is their fifth edition. It's got some really great information um, that I'm using here. So expanding upon our net energy production, so about four fifths of the coal consumed in Utah is mined in the state. Um, so again, we, we produce the coal, we use the coal, which is shown by this blue line, um, which is you know, the actual electrical energy production over time. Starting in 1960, you can see that coal is dominated in Utah. We've got great coal resources, which makes sense. Um, but you can see you know, renewables, natural gas are starting to uptick, which follows larger US trends overall. Um, I thought what was interesting though was, you know, in terms of national rankings, coal was 21st for the US. So, um, you know, out of all the states, Utah is the 21st uh, most user of coal for electrification. Um, natural gas was 37th. Uh, petroleum was ranked 33rd in energy production. And renewables was 42nd. So overall, we're a low energy using state um, at the time. But again, as that population grows, those trends are going to increase too. Uh, in terms of trends for water use, so again, looking, um, you know, at the entire United States, uh, Utah is located here. So, um, you know, we're kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of overall water use. And not surprisingly, for most states in the West, most of that water is going to irrigation, farming, um, growing food. Uh, you can see that the municipal side, there's 15% water consumption and mining comes in third at 6%. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not nothing in the state. It's certainly a, a chunk of the, the water use. Um, but if we dive into those numbers a little bit, most of that water is actually coming from brine sources, which is classified as, you know, having more salts in it than you might want for drinking water. So, this is water that would need some sort of treatment in general before you'd consider it um, for drinking water standards. So 82% um, of that water is coming from saline surface water. So uh, it didn't say the Great Salt Lake out loud, but that would make sense. Um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, brine producers on the Great Salt Lake evaporative production. 16% uh, of that water use came from saline groundwater and then the residual is made up of freshwater sources from mixed places. Uh, in terms of overall, uh, Utah was actually third in total water used for mining based on 2015 numbers by USGS. But again, the actual freshwater component that we would want to use for consumptive use was quite low. So that's good to see. Um, trends on climate, this probably isn't surprising to anybody, but um, climate change in Utah is going to result in reduced snowpack, which would lead to all other things being equal, uh, reduced soil moisture, reduced surface water availability, um, reduced lake and reservoir water levels. So again, um, competing demands with population, but also climate stressors um, will likely, you know, lead to increased demands uh, to share that um, resource correctly. Uh, so inc increased evaporation of evapotranspiration would occur as temperatures rise. Um, not surprising, maybe if you're a brine producer, you look at that and think, great, you know, I, I get more energy and um, that requires me to not necessarily wait as long to produce a mineral. Um, but again, those lower water levels, maybe you have to draw that water in from farther away. Um, in terms of precipitation, it's difficult to say. It's a toss-up, but that change in snow um, can have a significant effect on uh, reservoirs downstream. So in terms of the combined water and energy, nexus is the lingo that gets used. Um, you know, this first line, so water provision can be a highly energy-intensive process, and energy generation can use vast quantities of water. So these things are necessarily linked together 
Uh, so in locations where scarcity of one or the other exists, then it's hard to develop energy, especially in terms of uh, you know, thermal power generation, a lot of water is typically used. Um, so again, uh, Utah uses approximately 7% of its total energy budget uh, to provide water. So not, not a lot in terms of uh, water being provided that doesn't necessarily take into account um, you know, transportation or energy consumption, but overall, um, you know, because of the, the gravity feed systems we have in the mountains draining down to lower valleys, we're able to not use quite as much energy as a lot of other states. So the, the takeaway <laughs> is that cheap resources are great, but they're not guaranteed to stick around forever. Um, so we've had, you know, historically Utah's had the ability to rely on these cheap sources of energy. Um, but as things progress in the future with, again, climate, population changing, um, the demand on those resources is gonna increase. Um, so in terms of what that means on a, a dollars and cents point of view, uh, looking at groundwater pumping, um, this is some data to, provided by the Utah Division of Natural Resources. So based on 2010, you can see there were 975,000 acre feet of groundwater withdrawn. Um, they did some math to convert this to a total energy requirement. And based on the Utah rate of 8.4 uh, cents per kilowatt hour, that's almost $50 million in a year spent on groundwater pumping. So again, as we move forward in time, it's not unreasonable to expect those costs to go up. Um, again, as more energy production is required, the rates to produce that energy could increase with, with time. So in terms of data-driven solutions to wrap up, um, these are holistic concerns. They, they impact projects um, and mindsets globally and something that both Crystal and Peter hit on was, you know, um, the focus to say and do the right things up front um, as we're looking to bring more women into mining, as we're looking to build more data-driven solutions, um, explicitly adopting project management frameworks out front to say, these are the things we wanna target and we're interested in analyzing is really important. So just as one plug, um, the Envision framework is something that I think could be useful to mining operations. I'm sure they've got, you know, their own, uh, you know, Rio Tinto's got their own project management framework, I'm sure. But the thing I like about Envision is it's designed by the Army Corps of Engineers. Stantec actually had a little bit of input there as well, but it's, it's designed by engineers to help, you know, showcase the projects being looked at holistically and considering trade-offs between, you know, community, the bottom line, um, environmental concerns. So again, all those things happen on a project, but being explicit about tracking those from the get-go um, is really beneficial. Uh, the second point here is, you know, again, piggybacking off of what Peter said is you don't know what you don't measure. Um, so again, my, my inner scientist measure early, measure often, measure frequently. You can then talk with, you know, consultants, um, other miners about what that information means. Um, one way we try to integrate that information at Stantec is by using integrated water balance modeling to look at demands or uses of water over time using a software like GoldSim. Um, a lot of mines are starting to pick up this type of software as well. And something we haven't done internally, but I think would make a lot of sense is to couple that um, with energy requirement and production to show how those, you know, energy levels could change over time to help with forecasting projections and planning. Um, and then after doing some of that work, it would be much easier to go in and perform energy audits, look for efficiency gains, and then you know, discuss potential mine improvements. So with that, um, appreciate your attention. And if there's any questions, happy to take a few. Thank you, Alex.